What is going on, all you beautiful people? Andy Christopher here, aka the Dilf, the dad I listen to frequently, bringing you the latest and greatest with our next rendition of the Dilf Show. Um, thanks for tuning back in. It's it's a, a good week to be back, and we are going to talk about something that all parents encounter at um, at certain points, at different points in their you know early parenthood. Today, we're going to talk about mastering the bedtime routine. But before we get there, let's see what's going on. What's the latest and greatest in uh, in local life here? I'm trying to think. So, oh, of course, Arlo, our son, if you're just tuning in for the first time, finally pooped in the potty. Yeah. Woohoo. That was a big win. It was. I think Julia said it was 47 days after we initially started potty training. He was peeing perfectly fine, no issues, was just afraid to poop, just didn't didn't want to do it. Finally, past the point of no return after, if you remember the crazy story with um our friends in the in the Bay Area where we apocalypse occurred, but finally happened. He was so excited. We took him to, we got, don't, I got donuts for him in the morning. We took him to the arcade to play. It was like a big celebration for first poop in the potty. And believe it or not, he did it again. He pooped again in the potty and he didn't ask for all the, all the goodies, all the rewards. He was just ecstatic to have done it again. Um, with that being said, we, we take the wins with the losses. He did have an accident at daycare just just today believe it or not and eh, what can you do that's that kind of stuff's going to happen um remember that when you have a babysitter or a nanny or you take your child to daycare or something like that that these people are here to help your child you're you're paying for a service so a lot of times i know that julia and i always feel guilty oh man, we feel so bad that Arlo did this there. Well, that's what those people signed up for, you know? And so don't sweat the small stuff too much when it comes to, um, you know, your child having an accident at school or with the babysitter or something like that. That's, that's part of the game. That's part of the course. That's why you give your child to people that you trust. And so don't sweat it too much. Let's see. What else is going on? Arlo's been crushing some pizza. He's going through a big pizza phase, pizza rolls and pizza itself. We don't want to burn it out too much or jinx it because it's kind of soireeing back into the, I'm going to eat this for dinner. I'm going to not just eat snacks and crackers, although he does do that. Um, something we don't love and kind of leading into the bedtime routine He's kind of blown this up, but he won't eat dinner and then he will take on, well, he'll ask for milk before bed and then he'll ask for crackers. He'll ask for something cereal to, to have in his room, like after we shut out the lights. And that is so infuriating. It's just one of those things that you kind of can't plan for, but you just kind of take it in stride. Um, so aside from that, leading into the bedtime routine and kind of the mastering of your child's specific bedtime routine, clearly I am the one-stop shop and authority on how to put your child to bed. I know everything there is to know. Um, I'm just messing. I, we still we have to relearn stuff that we thought we knew from, you know, 12 months ago. And it's an ever evolving process. Parenthood is really just an evolution. And we always talk about failing forward and trying not to make the same mistakes twice, but knowing that mistakes are going to be inevitable. That's actually just a, a good way to go about living your life. But let's see. When it comes to the first, well, the first six months are kind of a wash. You know, your your child's sleeping next to you in the bassinet, and you're you're just kind of taking naps wherever you can. You've got little sleep areas set up throughout the house for whenever 
the baby is ready to go down. What I would recommend during those times is try to try to get them used to a pattern, try to get them used to a, a certain mechanism, just a, a brief, you know, a couple pats, maybe a kiss. I love you. You're going to take a nap now and then, and then lay them down. A tip that we received and we saw on Instagram was when you're, if your child has a really bad, like falling reflex or like a really bad spasm reflex, when they're trying to get put down, try your best to make sure that you're laying your child down with their arms flat. Cause what will happen is you'll pull them from your shoulder. You'll pull your child and then you'll go to lay them down and their arms will still be kind of not like many fists here, like ready to box, but they'll be furled up based off of them holding on to you for, you know, if they fell asleep on your chest or something like that. And then when you go to put them down, their arms start to fall. And that's when they feel that kind of falling reflex. So try to get their arms situated prior to laying them down and then just lay them down flat as can be. That will hopefully prevent Arlo had a horrible startle falling reflex, whatever you want to call it, horrible startle reflex for many, many months. And um, it was difficult. It was really difficult to get him out of that habit. And remembering and thinking back, we, you know, we tried everything. We really tried to, he would hulk out of it, all his swaddles. He loved napping on us. And I'm still in the first zero to six months. Um, but when we got the the magic Merlin sleep suit. That's really what changed the game for him because I think it put his arms in that flat position at the onset. He looked like a little Stay Puff Marshmallow man and it was objectively hilarious. If you haven't looked it up, magic Merlin sleep suit, talked about it on a very early episode. Check it out if your kid is struggling to nap or has a really bad startle reflex. But when we started getting him into kind of a similar routine where we put him in the suit, we'd start, you know, giving him some pats and then lay him down. It seemed like his nap times were extending and they started to get longer and stronger and he'd have deeper sleep, which is great. But when it comes to routines, you really, you're just fighting for your life the first 12 months really. And they're, they're going to nap when they're going to nap. They sleep all the time. It's, it's very frequent and they just had this whole huge life experience. So they got to get their shut eye to, to get their energy up. And so that really zero to 12 months, best recommendations are try to figure out if there's anything negative affecting like a starter reflex or Arlo also had really bad GERD. Just keep an eye out for these warning signs nothing's insurmountable. It's going to feel difficult. And when you try to put them down and they just keep waking up, it feels like time is standing still a bit. You're just like, damn it. I, I need my sleep too. We need to figure this out. We got to, you know, get dinner ready. We got to clean. We got to, we got other stuff to do. We have to work. Um, and it can feel very overwhelming because then you're just right back at, at the starting point, right back at square one. And just keep an eye out for what's what really led to a successful nap or a successful night of sleep. You aren't going to be able to emulate the same exact behaviors, but I feel like if you keep doing the same kind of checkpoints and the same routines from an early age, it gets them into their age one and early toddler years a lot easier. And I don't think I'm trying to remember correctly for us. I don't think Arlo slept all the way through the night until he was, man, we had a, we had a couple random nights, but it almost felt like 14 months old. I'm really, I really feel like that's accurate, but we've also had friends who their child sleeps through the night at two months old, kind of a grab bag, right? I've, I've also heard stories of kids not sleeping through the night until they're five. 
if you're one of those parents out there, you're the real hero, the real MVP. Keep on keeping on because that is tough to deal with. But getting and setting the mood and setting the ambiance is has been pivotal for a successful sleep routine. And like I said, this is just what works for us. It Make it your own and really see and know based off of your schedule. I mean, if you have a parent who works a graveyard shift, your sleep schedules are going to be very different to be able to put your child down at night. But when it comes to when we got Arlo into one, he's down to one nap a day, and then he goes to sleep at night. We try to emulate the nap to be what the sleep is going to be like in terms of similar routine minus bath time, minus brushing your teeth and nightly hygiene um, routines. But when, when everything kind of lines up and then they know what to expect, that to me is the secret sauce. When your child knows that, okay, as we're checking these boxes and as we're hitting these you know, sleep metrics, it's time for me to start throttling down. And yes, you're going to get a ton of pushback. You're going to get times when your child does not want to go to sleep or take a nap or something along those lines. And you'll just have to adjust and pivot. Really recommend staying calm, staying on that even keel that we've spoken about, because they're, they're just going to mirror your frustration if you're just going off the rails at the slightest inconvenience, right? We don't know what's going on in their heads, but if we give them the tools and set them up for the for success every single night, then then we have an advantage. At least we're you know fifty five forty five instead of instead of fifty fifty that this is going to happen, right? So when it comes to nap time and when it comes to starting to set a routine, really. Speak with your partner, speak with your significant other in terms of what's going to work best for your schedules, getting your schedules down, which is still something to this day that can be difficult based off of your family dynamic. I know that we still struggle with it despite best laid plans, at least putting it out there to know that there is an expectation, right? And for Julia and myself, we we will go back and forth in terms of who is able to and who wants to put the child down. Some, sometimes one parent's really tired. Sometimes a parent's really sick. Sometimes both parents are really sick. That, that makes for a fun, a fun event. We spoke about this a uh, few episodes ago where all three of us were sick and we're trying to rotate between trying to put them down and trying to use the toilet. And oh, it's just a literally a shit show. But we we get that in line with ourselves and then, you know, the other person gets cleaned up for the night or does laundry and dishes or something like that. Right. Um, so make it known in terms of your expectations with your partner. So it's not just the same person doing the same, trying to do the same song and dance over and over and over and over again, because that's going to get exhausting. One parent is going to burn out and that's going to lead to, fights or that's going to lead to frustrations that manifest themselves all over the course of your day, right? So getting in line and getting things straight with your partner. But then, you know, what we've learned, we try to keep things at a cooler temperature and we try to keep things as dark as possible. I'm not saying pitch black, especially when your children start to develop dreaming and fears and things like that. Pitch black can be really tough. You know, even though you do sleep better, the darker it is, just minimize the light to the best of your ability with whatever your home situation is, or whenever you're on the road, we try to minimize light and we try to keep things on the cooler side. Um, that's just science. I'm, I'm definitely a scientist. I'm basically Bill Nye, the science guy, but, um, getting, Setting the tone in that regard helps your child get signal that, all right, you know, we're, we're making some moves here. And then we, we kind of go back and forth. And what we've done is we've, we've sat in a rocking chair. We've told 
stories about our day. And then that leads into the reading of physical books. We always, always, always want to read at least a book before going to bed or taking a nap or something like that, because little man will pay attention to it and he'll interact with the words. Now he'll tease out different pictures and different things. He's really into this. I spy book that has, I think it's 180 plus pictures. And sometimes it's the last book you want him to take out of the pile because you know, you're in for a long haul and a lot of things, but then you start to cherish those moments and you start to call out different things and be impressed by them knowing what these different, these different items are. It's truly incredible. Um, so we like to get the, get those books read and let him have his water, let, let him have his, his unwind time. Um, just like with human beings, we try to go by the sleep hygiene, hygiene metrics as best as we can outside of, um, you know, the eat and drink, not like right before bed. When your child wants to eat or drink, you don't want them going to bed on an empty stomach or feeling uncomfortable. So just make sure they're taken care of, right? But we, we don't do screens or TV at least an hour before bed. And then when we're actually doing the nighttime routine, we, we walk up the stairs together, we take a bath. Sometimes Arlo will take a bath with mom or myself. Um, we, we have some fun, but we don't draw out the bath time for 20 to 25 minutes, pushing a half an hour. We get in there, we get clean and, and we move on. He's got a lot of toys in there and sometimes getting him to get out is difficult, but it shouldn't be something where we're just stewing there and delaying what we're seeing later. And now in Arlo's coming up on three years old now is the, the masterful and artful stall techniques are just, it's truly inspiring to see how his mind works and how he can just, just grind every additional minute to, to stay awake and keep those lights on. Um, but the bath is not one of those things. We, we get him out pretty, you know, within, within seven to 10 minutes, we're, we're out of the bath, if not sooner than that. Um, then we get, we get teeth brushed. We, we sit in our chair, we make our way to his bedroom and we do lotion. We're continuing to talk about our day. We're asking him what books he wants to read. Um, and that is the same thing every single night without fail. You know, if we're traveling on the road, we do some hybrid version of it, but we always have the checkpoints that we hit, you know, bath, sit, talk, books, and, and wind down, right? So as you're figuring out your own routine, ask yourself those questions. What are the things that your child likes to do? What are the things that we non-negotiably do not want to do right before bed? And what do we feel is going to put our child in the best possible situation to, to fall asleep quickly? Because, you know, we've had times when he's, he's been really, obviously with Julia being pregnant and we're just a few days away from, from baby girl album dropping, but Julia hasn't been in there to put him down because it's harder for her to get in and out of the bed. Right. So I've been putting him down, but there have been times in the past few months where I'll be able to be in there for, you know, we'll, we'll shut lights off and I'll let him know exactly what's happening. It's another piece is just talking them through what's happening, not just putting it on them. I let them know, you know, we're going to turn the lights off in two minutes. We're going to do this. I'm going to scratch your back for this many minutes and then I'm going to leave the room. Just talk them through it. Let them know what's coming. They'll, they'll get it. They'll start to respond. But Julia hasn't been in there recently. And in previous months, I've been able to turn lights off and be out of there within 10 minutes. You know, we don't just lay him down. We want him to feel comforted. And some parents just say, you know, throw him in the room, get, get jammies on and say, Hey, you know, good night. <laughs> That's it. If that's your speed. That's your speed. Other parents, you know, they're maybe still sleeping in the bed with you. That's your speed. Consistency can still take place during all those things. But for us and with me, I've been able to 
sometimes get out very quickly. And Julia will, unfortunately, it'll be an hour and a half before she's able to get out because he will just whine and wail and tug at her heartstrings to keep her in there as long as possible. And that's difficult during, during the pregnancy. So those, you can't know which parent is going to have quote unquote, the hot hand, which one the child is going to want to be with that particular night or that particular week or that particular month. Those are always going to be adjustments that, you know, you're calling audibles on, on the fly. And as long as you're all on the same page or you're on the same page with your partner, then, you know, what's the difference? It, I, I thought it, it's been great being able to put him down every night. That doesn't mean that I don't get frustrated sometimes when all of a sudden we're pushing a later time and I, I want to get my sleep routine going. I, I'm, I'm sleepy too. And so I, I, I have cherished the moments, but as we've spoken about, you're, you're constantly in this mental flux of you're dealing with a lot of different balls in the air. And sometimes the, your child is just striking the wrong chord with you and it can be difficult to, to manage. But as long as that doesn't manifest in, in any other way, you can, you can maintain your calm and your eye contact and your communicative presence and be, everyone can be completely simpatico for it. So make your routine your own, make it, make it clear to one another and just stick to it. That was where we saw the biggest success was when we just kept, you know, sticking to the timelines and it's kind of pushed. It used to be seven 30. Now it's eight o'clock from when we really get things going. And just because he's more excited and he's got a lot more energy for longer in the day, it's kind of part of life. Right. And I know that the bell curve is coming for him. But that's not, that's not for a while. I, I think when I was looking back when I was in high school, I, I probably slept more than I did anything else. I bodies just keep growing. They're incredible things, but I feel like I slept a lot looking back on it. Now it's, it's hard to get a good night's sleep. I'm sure you're all experiencing something similar and you just cherish when you only have to wake up to pee once in the middle of the night. Right. Um, but make your routine your own and really, really do everything you can to shut off the outside extraneous factors because iPhone screens, television screens, they're, it extends without you feeling like you've done anything different. It just naturally extends the, the, the sleep cycle of the brain. And that's not something that you can stop unless you physically turn those things off. Um, we also do use a sound machine. We're, we're really whittling that down. And for, um, for baby girl, we are hoping that we can get her used to more normal sounds and just life happening rather than just relying on the sleep machine. That being said, Julia and I use a sleep machine, a sleep sound machine in our room. So who's to say, right? Um, but find the things that work for you and, um, you know, something that works for another family nearby, you could always give it a shot, but if it's not working for you, don't force anything. You know, we've, we've tried things and we just didn't force it after a certain time we tried the, so Arlo would never be swaddled when he was younger. So we tried the sleep sack and he would just freak out because he couldn't let his arms free. Finally, we learned that there was a sleep sack where your legs were contained, but your arms went through like cutoff sleeves. And he loved that. He absolutely adored it. So don't just, don't just continue to, you know, beat a drum that's not making any sound. If it's really not working for your child, don't force them to be uncomfortable, you know, give it its chance to, to, to breathe and to, to work, you know, don't freak out if it doesn't work in within the first two seconds, but if it's repeatedly not happening for you, there's, there's no need to move forward with that particular thing or item or technique or whatever it is. So let me know your thoughts. What, what sleep routines do you have with your children? How have things evolved from when your child, when your child was one to when they were five to when they were 12, what changed and how did you handle those changes as a family with your significant other? Drop me a line. Let me know at the Dilf show on all our socials, the Dilf show at gmail.com. 
feel free to shoot me an email. Love reading the emails that, that pop in. It gives me a lot more fodder and content for upcoming weeks. And I always want to know what's resonating with you. So let me know what you want to hear more about. And I'm happy to devote an entire episode or a portion of an episode entirely to that. That's all I got for you this week, ladies and gentlemen. I love you. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Go have a great one.